Hello and welcome everybody to my talk, an overview of the botnet simulation framework. My name is Leon Böck and I'm a third year PhD student at the Technische Universität of Darmstadt, Germany. This work has been worked on by me and my colleagues Shanka Karupaya, Max Müllhäuser and Emmanuel Vasilo Manolakis. So what I want to talk about today is first and foremost, why somebody would want to use the botnet simulation framework then some in-depth on peer-to-peer -peer botnets, then an overview of uh, BSF and its functionality, then another section on PCAP injection, and then followed by an evaluation and a conclusion. So why would anyone want to use BSF? First and foremost, it can be used to build better systems for tracking peer-to-peer -peer botnets. So it is an environment to experiment and simulate peer-to-peer -peer botnets, peer-to-peer -peer botnet tracking mechanisms, and also anti-tracking mechanisms that try to avoid these tracking mechanisms implemented by botmasters. And it can also be used to detect possibly unknown peer-to-peer -peer botnets by creating synthetic network traces of simulated botnets and injecting these into real PCAPs to then test botnet detection systems or intrusion detection systems in the real world. So why peer-to-peer -peer botnets? So most of you are probably familiar with centralized botnets where a botmaster sets up a server that commandeers and forwards commands to the infected machines. It has a simple setup, uses common protocols that many programmers are familiar with, such as HTTPS, and it's simple to set up because of that most of the time, but it has a single point of failure in the centralized server, which if it's taken down, completely disables the control of the peer-to-peer -peer botnet. Contrary, a uh, peer-to-peer botnet is a little more complex to implement and probably because of that less common in the world, but it's highly resilient because every single infected peer can be used to forward botmaster commands and keep the botnet alive and the communication and control structure alive. So here's a quick view of how we see peer-to-peer -peer botnets in a graph representation and how they function in maintaining the overlay. So starting with a bot zero here, it has a neighbor list of other bots, their IP addresses and ports usually, with which it can communicate and exchange messages. And we can represent these contents of a neighbor list as a directed graph, as it is shown here. And then we have the botmaster that can come in at any point of this network, try to inject their commands. And even if we as defenders are capable of blocking this, the botmaster can just switch to another infected machine and inject the commands there, which are then passed around in the network in a gossip fashion reaching eventually all the infected machines. So over time, machines may go offline, come back online, the botnet changes and evolves. And in order to keep track of that, most peer-to-peer -peer botnets exchange messages frequently in a so-called membership management interval in which they just check in if their uh, neighbors maybe have new updates, if they are still available, and generally to remain connected within the overlay. At some point in time, a bot may actually go offline, like in this case, bot B2. And if B0 tries to probe B2, it will not get a reply from it. And continuous probing will fail if and fail again, which leads to B0 removing B2 from its neighbor list and then actively looking for additional entries by sending these messages to its other neighbors, like B1 here, to then establish a connection to B6 as a replacement for B2. This last mechanism that I talked about can be used by us researchers and defenders to actually monitor or crawl the botnet. So we can implement a crawler that speaks parts or all of the protocol and then send these messages to discover additional bots to an entry bot and from there crawl our way through the entire network iteratively discovering the infected machines in the network. A similar tool but more passive are sensor nodes which are also participating in the overlay of the peer-to-peer -peer botnet 
waiting for incoming connections to then track the spots that establish a connection to the sensor instead of actively establishing connections to the bots. So how do we recreate this in our simulation fr framework? First and foremost, our focus is on the network overlay as shown in the top left of this diagram, where we simulate the interaction between bots, crawlers, sensors, and any other node you can think of. Underneath this is a network underlay that is a star network with a router that connects all the nodes present in the network, such as bots, crawlers, and sensors. And then we have a few global components that are used to inject or track the progress of the simulation outside of the overlay, such as the botmaster, which is a component that could inject a new command at any point in the network, a churn generator that is responsible for sending bots online and sending new bots, uh, old bots offline. We have a network analyzer that is used to um, extract the information about the simulation state, such as the graph representation or the message traces of the simulation, and a global node list to keep track of all the bots present in the network. And lastly, we have configuration files, which we inherit from the Omnet++ simulator on top of which Botnet Simulation Framework was built, which allows us to easily configure the simulations without changing the code. So to give you a little more detail on the, on the components of BSF, we have an implementation of a bot called SimpleBot, and its purpose is to be a default implementation of a peer-to-peer -peer botnet that follows the patterns of various unstructured peer-to-peer -peer botnets that we have observed in the wild. And it is highly configurable, allowing you to run simulations on botnets by just changing the initialization files instead of the code. Among its features are enable list that maintains other known bots, then the membership management, which steers the frequent communication with its neighbors to check if they're still available and update the stale connections. And optionally, it can also be used to forward botmaster commands or implement countermeasures against tracking such as crawlers. Talking about crawlers, we also have a simple crawler implementation in BSF right now that can be extended or one could implement their own crawlers and sensors if they wanted to. And the purpose of this is to track bots iteratively in the network, extract the information, export this information, which can then later be compared against the ground truth exported by the statistics modules of BSF. And among its features are a configurable crawl interval. So should it crawl every second or every hour and log these results. Then I have hinted towards the churn within a peer-to-peer -peer botnet already. And this is a very crucial factor within the simulation because apart from the protocol itself, this determines how the overlay is constructed and therefore how quick a message spreads within the network, how resilient the network is to node failures, how resilient the network may be to take down attempts or sync holding attempts by defenders. So the purpose is to recreate realistic churn behavior as it would appear in the real world while still maintaining and giving us the opportunity to specify a desired active population. So if you want to run an analysis on a botnet that has 5,000 bots active at any point in time, you can specify this and the churn generator and the logic behind it will take care of giving you an average around 5,000 active bots. So how does this work? Um, it sends off uh, sends bots online or offline based on probability distributions, namely the lifetime distribution, which if a bot comes online, it draws from that distribution a value which specifies for how long the bot will stay online in the simulation. And then we have the inter-arrival distribution, which specifies after which time a new bot will join the network from the amount of currently inactive bots. So to visualize this, I have this image on the right with a faucet uh, pouring water at a constant rate into a bucket, which the bucket is our simulation. And then there's holes in the bucket where water is flowing out, which is the bots leaving the network. So the faucet is running at a constant rate in our case of the simulation, which means bots 
draw always from the same inter-arrival distribution to join the network. So what happens here is that joining, they all draw a lifetime, which when it comes to an end, they will, so to say, leave the bucket through one of the holes. However, as more bots join the bucket, the likelihood of any of these coming to the end of their lifetime increases and the amount of bots leaving increases as well the fuller the bucket is or the more bots are active in the population. And this leads to a somewhat oscillating effect around the specified and desired active population with still a realistic behavior of bots coming online and going offline as we would see it in the real world. And the distributions we have chosen are so that they can be fed from real world measurements that we have taken, for example, for the Celity botnet or the zero access botnet and recreate that term pattern that we have observed in real world botnets before. And if you want to have more details on this, maybe have a look at our paper from Ray 2018, where we explain the churn in greater detail. Lastly, I want to talk about the configuration files. So there are these configuration files that can be used to simply specify how to run a simulation. For example, set the size of the botnet, set the types of the bots that you want, such as simple bot or a more specific implementation of, for example, Celity or zero access. You could set the number of crawlers that you want to have present in the simulation and choose a churn model that recreates the desired churn behavior and many more. As a second part of BSF, I want to talk about the PCAP injection. So BSF itself only looks at the overlay communication and how messages are exchanged between bots abstracting from the underlay. So there are no real packets, no UDP protocol, no TCP protocol underlying it, but just plain and simple messages exchanged in the simulation. However, we, we might want to use the simulated botnets to test botnet detection systems or intrusion detection systems to check if they could detect these types of botnets. So we leverage a second tool called ID2T or the Intrusion Detection Dataset Toolkit, which is capable of transforming the overlay communication from our simulation into real packets and inject them into any given PCAP file that may be uh, taken from an office environment, a home environment or other network. So how does this work in a little greater detail? ID2T gets two inputs. One is an existing PCAP file. The second one is a communication trace exported from the botnet simulation framework, and then a set of injection parameters that tell ID2T how to combine these two input sources. And the output of ID2T would then be a PCAP file, including all the original traffic overlaid with the injected peer-to-peer -peer botnet traffic on top of it or just a plain PCAP file containing only the injected peer-to-peer -peer botnet traffic, deleting the original input. To evaluate our botnet simulation framework, we first want to showcase the runtime performance of BSF itself to give you an idea of what can and what cannot be done within the simulation in reasonable time. So to do this, we simulate three different botnets, namely the game over Zeus, Celity and hide and seek parameters using the simple bot and its configuration parameters. And the most crucial parameters uh, re uh, regarding to runtime of the simulation are the neighbor list size, which the higher it is, the more messages are sent by each bot in every membership management interval, increasing the amount of events that need to be simulated by the simulator. Similarly, the membership management interval, the lower it is, the more often a bot checks if its neighbors are online and again, increasing the overall number of messages exchanged and therefore the events and the runtime of the simulation. And then also the total or active bots of the simulated botnets have the same effect as the more bots, the more messages again, and again, a higher runtime. And the same accounts for the duration. So if you want to simulate a botnet, for example, 10 days in each of these three cases, this has an impact on the runtime as well. So showing you here some of the results, as you can see, the Celity simulation of 10 days took the longest, whereas the game over and hide and seek simulation took 
lesser than that with an average of two hours versus an average of 13 and a half hours. Why is this the case? The Sality botnet has a very large neighbor list size and as I explained earlier, the larger the neighbor list size, the more messages need to be exchanged, increasing the runtime. A second observation is that Game Over Zeus and Hide and Seek seem to have the same runtime even though their neighbor list size and membership management interval are different with Hide and Seek having a very short membership management interval which should increase the runtime of the simulation significantly. But then if we look at the total on active bots specified for each of these botnets in the simulation, Game Over Zeus has 10 times more the bots simulated and still just takes the same amount of a, an average of two hours for simulation. So again here the low membership management interval of hide and seek decrease the capabilities of bots that we can simulate in reasonable time frame. Nevertheless we want to point out that if you have a strong processor and a lot of time you could simulate even hide and seek with more bots than that but it may degrade to the point where the simulation actually takes longer than real time. So 50 days of simulation might take 70 days of real time. Secondly, I would like to show you an experimental setup for the traffic injection of um, BSF traces into a real PCAP. And to do this, we took a real Celity trace taken from the Stratosphere Labs CTU dataset and we use Wireshark to extract all the conversation statistics of that Celity peer-to-peer -peer traffic located in the PCAP. And then we also use a random PCAP from which we will delete the original content with ID2T and use ID2T to inject a simulation of the Celity botnet into that original PCAP. Oh, sorry. And this results in a PCAP mimicking Celity peer-to-peer -peer traffic based on our simulation. And then again, we use Wireshark to extract the conversation statistics from this to compare it against the conversation statistics of the real Celity trace. And the results can be he seen here, where we have a difference in the conversation of the real Celity and mimicked Celity. So that means the bot in the real Celity talked to only 621 other hosts, whereas the mimicked one talked to 1059 other hosts. And looking into this, this wasn't expected because Celity has a neighbor list size of a thousand. So we would have expected the real Celity to communicate to at least a thousand other peers. But looking deeper into the sample that was presented it only had 740 bootstrap peers and we assume that in the contained environment where it was executed it was not able to find additional peers and add them to its neighbor list having it at such a lower number than expected. Similarly if we look at the bytes and the packets for the real Celity we have a higher number of bytes and higher number of average packets exchanged in each of these conversations but then again, because of the Celity sample not having a full neighbor list, it will probably probe a lot of its neighbors with additional messages, checking and to find additional peers to fill up its neighbor list, increasing the number of packets and bytes exchanged for each conversation. So if we normalize by dividing the number of bytes by the number of packets, we get much more similar results of 60, 76 bytes per packet for the real Celity and 73 bytes per packet for the mimic Celity. Again, the duration seems off for both of these samples, but this is actually um, related to how the membership management interval functions every 40 minutes. And if we cut the PCAP at a certain point, we will get these discrepancies in the duration of the conversations. Again, for the packets exchanged between A and B, and B and A are just a little more detailed than the aforementioned overall averages. So to conclude, the botnet simulation framework can be used to simulate various peer-to-peer -peer botnets and experiment with tracking and anti-tracking mechanisms. It can be used in conjunction with ID2T to inject botnet traffic into PCAPs, and we foresee that this could be used in the following cases, such as generating communication traces to test intrusion detection systems and botnet detection mechanisms on botnets that we haven't seen in the wild before without releasing another botnet. Um, 
then the dynamic analysis of botnet resilience. So in the past, botnet resilience was oftentimes viewed as a frozen snapshot of the network. And we could change this by trying sinkhole attacks or takedown attempts in the simulation while it still maintains its membership management and tries to recover during the process of attacking it, leading us to eventually even be able to test takedown strategies before they are deployed in the wild. I want to leave you with some previous works uh, that use BSF in case you are interested in looking into the capabilities even more. And I would like you to thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking forward to answering your questions. Thanks.